Dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever you may be this morning, whether uh, overseas or here in Malaysia, we welcome you to our uh, service this morning uh, here at St. Mary's Cathedral, the third Sunday of Epiphany. Friends, today we are still uh, continuing with a series of sermons from Mark's Gospel, particularly chapter 1, uh, preached to us by Pastor Andy Woodliffe. Mark's preface in chapter 1 drives us to consider 1. who Jesus is, 2. why Jesus came, and 3. what are the benefits of receiving Jesus as God's promised Messianic King. So let us explore further this morning with uh, Pastor Andy Bulif uh, as we explore further the identity and mission of Jesus, God's Messianic King. And friends, as we begin uh, our service time this morning, how appropriate it is for those of us who have embraced Jesus as uh, our Saviour and our King, to sing the song we declare. Hallelujah. 
Church, let us confess the words of the Apostle Creed so that we may reaffirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, sisters and brothers, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is ever faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our many sins and not to conceal them in the presence of God our Heavenly Father but to confess them with a penitent and obedient heart so that we may be forgiven through His boundless goodness and mercy. Let us therefore draw near to the throne of our gracious God through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and confess our sins together. And together we say the general confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbours in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and leave. He pardons and absorbs all them that truly repent and believe his holy gospel. For this reason, let us ask him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our lives may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord, keep me believing the gospel of grace. The scripture reading for today is taken from Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Church. Today's psalm reading is taken from Psalm 41, reading from verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I say, O oh Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die? and his name perish. And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words, while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say, a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me, and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. But you have upheld me because of my integrity, and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The New Testament reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, Verses 9 to 11. In those days, 
Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the past two weeks, we've been asking the question, who is Jesus according to God? Who is Jesus according to God? And we've been looking at that through the perspective of Jesus' baptism, because there the heavens open and God declares these words. Mark 1 verse 11. God says to Jesus and about Jesus, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. And so in the previous two weeks, we looked at the first two, that Jesus is God's son and his beloved. But now we're going to look at the third, that Jesus is the one in whom God is well pleased. And so following what we've done in the past two weeks, we're going to take the same trajectory. We're going to ask the question, what does it mean for God to be pleased, to delight in something? What does it mean that God delights in Jesus specifically? And lastly, what does that mean for us? Right. So what does it mean for God to have pleasure, to delight in something? What does it mean that he delights in Jesus specifically? And then lastly, what does that mean for us? So first point. It's a very simple point, but it's a point that we often overlook in theology. But our God is a God who delights in things. He is a God who shows forth pleasure. He is a happy God. And we see this throughout scripture. So, for example, in Psalm 104, God rejoices in the things that he has made. God is pleased in his creation. Or in Luke 15, uh, God rejoices at the uh, repentance of a sinner. God is pleased when that happens. And this is a good thing. It's good that God shows pleasure in these but as we saw last week, just as God doesn't need creation in order to love, neither does he need creation in order to be pleased, in order to be satisfied. No, prior to creation and by himself, God had abundant pleasure, satisfaction in himself. Because our God is a God who is sufficient unto himself and he is satisfied in himself. He doesn't need anything external to him to be content, to be, uh, uh, to be satisfied. And in this sense, God is very different from us. We need to think about this for a little bit. Because as creatures, we are not self-sufficient, and we are not self-satisfied. We need things outside of us to be content. We have a simple demonstration of this every day. We must eat and we must drink. We need these things outside of us. But these point to a deeper underlying reality, that is we can only be satisfied, truly satisfied, in the one who provides us with these things, in our creator, God. You see, you and I, as God's creatures, were meant to be satisfied, to be content, to find pleasure in him, the one who is by himself perfectly satisfied, perfectly content, rejoicing in his own being. You see, for us, part of our understanding of sin is that it is a failure to appreciate God, a failure to rejoice in him and a failure to be content in him. And it is actually an exchanging of this God towards things in the creation. 
So you want to be satisfied in relationships. You look for a girlfriend or for a boyfriend or you look for anything else because you're not satisfied in God. Or you look for abundance of material possessions and you're constantly trying to add more and more things because you think that these will satisfy. Or you aspire to achieve great things, whether academically or in your career, because these things, the position that you have in the world, will one day make you satisfied. It is the God of the belly, the desire to be permanently consuming, always seeking satisfaction, but never quite reaching it. It's a tragedy. And the Bible describes this. Uh, It describes it, I think, well in two places, in Jeremiah 2 and in uh, Romans 1. Jeremiah describes it this way. My people have changed their glory, that is the glory of God, for that which does not profit. And Paul says in Romans 1 that the truth about sin is we have exchanged the glory of God for images resembling mortal man and birds, and creeping things, things in the creation. Instead of being satisfied in God, instead of being pleased in God, we seek satisfaction and contentment elsewhere. Now, of course, this has a consequence. It has a consequence in that we are never satisfied. It also has a consequence that we are under God's judgment and his curse. But it also has another consequence, which is that As those who have rejected and rebelled against God, we are not pleasing to God. In fact, Paul makes the point very strongly. He says in Romans 8 that it is impossible for those who are in the flesh to please God. So for us who are sinful, who've turned aside from God and have sought satisfaction and pleasure in all of these things, That rejection of God means that we are no longer pleasing in sight and nor can we please him. You think that you can satisfy God in the things that you do, in racking up credits for yourself, in in ticking all of the boxes. The nature and the reality of sin, the fact that you have turned aside from God, means that by nature you and I cannot please God. That's the wrong way to go. God cannot look at you and he cannot look at me by ourselves and say, as he says to Jesus, in you, I am well pleased. No, because we were not pleased with God. God is not and he could not be pleased with us. But you see, the truth of this passage, the truth of the baptism, is that Jesus is different, right? God can, he is, and he does take pleasure in Jesus, right? He can say to Jesus, in you my soul delights, in you I abound in joy, in you I am well pleased. And I think in particular, what we see in the baptism is the two aspects of God's pleasure in his son. On the one hand, God delights in Jesus for who he is. And on the other hand, God delights in Jesus for what he does, right? For who he is and also for what he does. On the one hand, This passage points us forward into the Gospels and it points us to the transfiguration. It points us to that time when Jesus is elevated and his face shines and his clothes are radiant and white. And God again repeats the words to the disciples. This is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because in that great event, Jesus is revealed as the radiance of the Father's glory, the one in whom all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, God of God and light of light, the one who is eternally the Father's object of pleasure and delight. You see, God can look at Jesus in the transfiguration and he can declare to the disciples and to us, look at Jesus. 
Well, look at him as his face shines in glory. Look at him, the one who is my eternal son. Look at this one. This is the one in whom I have always been pleased and in whom I will always be pleased. See, that's Jesus. He is the one who is by nature the one in whom God delights. The brightness of his majesty is the object of his father's joy. But more than that, these words point us back to the Old Testament because the phrase, in you I am well pleased, is pretty much a direct translation of what we see in Isaiah 42 concerning the servant of the Lord. Have a look at that with me now. Isaiah 42, hopefully on your screen. Here we find these words. God says, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. God takes pleasure in this servant. And what we read in the next sentence, this is the one upon whom God has put his spirit. And so the point in the baptism in Matthew and Mark and Luke is is really very simple. That as the spirit descends upon Jesus and as God says, this is the one in whom I am well pleased. The writers are saying, and God is saying, that this Jesus is the Isianic servant. This is the one that Isaiah was talking about. Jesus is that servant. And what do we discover about this servant? What is it that he is like? And and why does God take pleasure in him? Well, verse 2 and verse 3, I think, tell us. The servant will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. He's not arrogant. He's not boastful. He's not rude. Verse three, a bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. In other words, we here we have a picture of meekness. We have a picture of gentleness and of tenderness, a, a, a reed, a, a really valueless plant, broken. And yet instead of snapping it off and breaking and tearing it away and throwing it into the fire, there is gentleness and healing and restoration. The smouldering wick, which so easily could be snuffed out, is tended and fanned into flame. These are the qualities that God sees in his servant. And this is what God delights in. And furthermore, this is this is only the start of what we see in the servant's character, because by the end of this servant's uh, theme, as we reach into Isaiah 52 and 53, there we see the servant who in his meekness is willing to suffer and die for his people so that God could bless them. You see, the, the servant, the one who is meek, the one who does not crush the reed, the one who does not snuff out the wick, the one who is willing to lay down his life for his people. This is the one in whom God is well pleased. God delights in Jesus because of who he is in the brightness of his majesty and because of what he does in the beauty of his meekness. The Father is well pleased and deservedly so in Jesus. And therefore, and because of Jesus and because of his work for us, God can and he does take pleasure in us. In fact, we we did read this recently when we looked at Luke chapter 2. What did the angels say to the shepherds? Peace on earth on those upon whom God's pleasure rests, upon those in whom he is well pleased. And why is that? How can God be pleased with us? I I said a moment ago that God could not be pleased with us, that it was impossible for those who were in the flesh to please God. Well, it is because of the work of Christ, 
who offered himself up for us in the words of Ephesians 5 as a pleasing aroma to God, that we can stand in him as those who are pleasing to God. You see, Jesus has worked on our behalf And now as we are united in him, God can look at him and he can look at us in him and say to you and to me, in you, I am well pleased. God takes pleasure in his people. He takes pleasure in those whom he has redeemed through Christ. He has not had to have his arm twisted. He is not reluctant in seeing his people saved. No, again from Luke, it is the Father's good pleasure to give his people the kingdom. Not fundamentally or primarily because he delights in us of ourselves, but because he delights in Jesus and delights in his work. But brothers and sisters, there is more to it than that, obviously, because the Bible also tells us that we are called to please God. It's not just that because we stand in Christ that God is pleased in us, that is true, but we are also called in Christ to be those who now please God. So, for example, we see this as a a general statement. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we make it our aim to please him. Or Ephesians 5, he tells the church, try to discern what is pleasing to God. And before I move on to the specifics, I just want you to think about that. That is an amazing privilege. If you are able now to please God, it is only because God has so worked to make you pleasing to him and to make your works able to please him. As Christians, you stand in a wonderful position. You are actually those who are able to offer something which is pleasing to God in and through Christ. And so there are some specifics that we see. And so, for example, in, in Colossians 3.20, uh, Paul says this. He says to children, children, obey your parents for this pleases the Lord. That is, children, if you're listening, that the way you submit to your your parents, the way you obey them, the way you uh, try to humbly submit to them is a thing that is actually pleasing to God. It's a good thing. Or in Hebrews 13, and as I discussed last week, do not neglect to do good and to share because this is pleasing to God. That is, when you give up your possessions and give up your money and give to the poor and needy and give to your brothers in Christ who are suffering, that is something which is pleasing to him. However, before I close, I want to to make one last point. I could list forever examples of what you could do to please God. But actually, I want to say that the call as Christians is deeper than that. It's much deeper than that. See, we're not just called to please God. We are those who are called to find our pleasure in God. We are those who are supposed to be delighted in and to rejoice in him. And sanctification is not just about reforming our actions It is about redirecting our pleasures, right? Sanctification, growing as a believer, is not just about changing what we do, but deeper than that, it's about changing what we desire, right? So if you struggle with sin, often at the root of that is a desire that we have that is outside of God, that is still in creation. Let me give you one very simple example, right? Think about the way that we use our words. And right? sometimes we will use our words in gossip, in slander, in putting other people down, right? The snarky, snide comments. Now, why do we do that? Right? Why do we use our words that way? 
Well, if we think about it just a little bit, the reason we do that is because we actually take pleasure in that. When we put someone down, we elevate ourselves up and we feel good about that. When we gossip about someone, we're saying to other people that we are in the know, right? That we somehow know what's going on here and we can communicate that to you from our privileged position of knowledge. We delight in this. But you see, that is not like the servant. That is not using our power in meekness and humility. It's not using it to build and to restore and to heal, but rather to break down and to wound. It is taking the reed and breaking it. It is taking the faintly burning wick and snuffing it. You see, we have to be those who don't just take, uh, don't just desire to, to change outwardly our actions, but deeper than that, to be reforming our pleasures so that we delight in the things that delight God. In short, we should also be those who say with God that we take pleasure in the qualities, the attributes, the characteristics which are displayed in God's Son. Our call as Christians is to take pleasure in Jesus. So I'm going to close in in one part of scripture. I want to uh, think about how it is that we might do this. And I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 to leave you to think about this. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. And Paul says this, And we all with unveiled face are beholding the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. See, what's going on there? Paul is describing a, 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 the sanctification as a process where we are beholding the glory of God revealed in Christ, and in that beholding, we are being transformed into his image. In other words, I think what Paul is saying is that we become like what we behold. Right? If we are beholding Christ, if we're taking pleasure in him, if we're delighting in him, if we're communing with him in his word and praying and, and desiring to see more of him, then we will become like him. But if we spend our time delighting in other things, then we will gradually become like them. If you behold money and that is the object of your desire, you will become greedy and avaricious. If sex is the object of your desire, then you will probably become exploitative. But if Jesus is the object of your desire and you want to behold him, then you will become more and more like him. You will be conformed from one degree of glory to the other. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to end with the call can we say with God that we take pleasure in Jesus? And as those who now stand in Jesus and as those in whom God is well pleased, let us also be those who seek to be pleasing to God by finding our pleasure in Jesus. Let us pray. In the words of the psalmist, whom have I in the heavens high but thee, O Lord, alone, and in the earth whom I desire, besides thee there is none. Gracious Father, we do pray that these words would become our own, that we would desire uh, more and more your risen and glorified Son, and we pray that you would be conforming us more and more into his image from one degree of glory to another. Help us in all things to be pleasing to you by finding our pleasure in Jesus. And we ask this for your name's sake. Amen.
Let us pray. O God, our Creator and Preserver, we pray for people of every race and in every kind of need. Make your ways known on earth to saving power among all nations. We remember the nations of the world that are hard hit by COVID-19. We commit the United Kingdom to you, praying for wisdom and right judgment upon the British authorities and people in handling the crisis. Let Christ be revealed in this time. We also pray for your protection upon family members and friends currently in the UK. In our nation, Malaysia, we pray for the young Libutuan Agong, the Prime Minister, and all other men and women of authority. Grant this nation the measure of good governance and stability needed to effectively combat the COVID pandemic and to handle the current political and social economic challenges. Direct on God all efforts in fighting the pandemic. Sustain our healthcare system and frontliners. May all segments of society play their part as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church throughout the world, guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Give wisdom and strength, O God, upon our bishop-elect, Dr. Stephen Abarau, and Vicar General, Eddie Ong, as well as all the clergy, including our cathedral pastoral team. Guide and sustain all congregations within our diocese, as well as all other churches nationwide, in these challenging times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend your fatherly goodness, all who are anxious or distressed in mind or body, comfort and relieve them in their need, give them patience in their sufferings, and bring good out of their troubles. We pray for those who are unwell, that they may be restored to good health. We commit to you Major Tang, Victor Long, Caroline Tinker, Prem Kumar, Edward Das, and Kathleen's parents, as well as all others known to us personally. Let your grace and peace sustain them and their caregivers. We also give thanks for the life of Madam Jyoti Samuel, whose death anniversary falls around this time. May her family and friends continually draw comfort in the knowledge that those who died in the faith of Christ rest now in peace and will surely rise in glory. O oh God, we surrender to you all our various cares and worries in these difficult times. We thank you for the assurance that you, who know our every struggle, are able to carry us through. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Please spend a few quiet moments now praying for those people known to you and for things that may have happened over the past few days since the recording of these online prayers. Greetings. We now pray the Collect for the third Sunday of Epiphany. We pray together. Almighty God, whose Son revealed in signs and miracles the wonder of your saving presence, renew your people with your heavenly grace, and in all our weaknesses sustain us by your mighty power. To Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, sisters and brothers, and I'm glad you've joined us today for our online service. A special welcome to those who are new here. Uh, please can you fill out a connection card that's uh, at the link below or on our website uh, so we can welcome you. Uh, let's not forget to greet each other uh, on YouTube, Facebook or Zoom. Uh, may I suggest, uh, in addition to saying hello, let's just write down something that we've learnt or been reminded of from God's Word today. Maybe something from the sermon, or maybe from a reading, or some other part of the service. It uh, doesn't matter if we all say the same thing, it doesn't matter if we all say different things. But let's encourage each other by just sharing one thing that we've learned or been reminded of today. Uh, let's do that for a moment. Don't forget that our virtual tea terrace uh, will be open right after church this morning. Uh, where you can drop in for a few minutes uh, and say hello uh, to other people who are part of this service. Now, the link to the Tea Terrace is on the screen, uh, and it's also on our website and in YouTube or Facebook uh, on the page there as well. Can I also remind you, if you're not uh, subscribed yet to our emails, uh, or they're going to spam, uh, do subscribe, make sure you get them. Uh, it's been great to see a steady stream of people signing up for small groups uh, in these last couple of weeks. Uh, if you're interested, please do so at the link below. Uh, and if you tried to sign up last year and you couldn't find one that suited you for some reason, uh, maybe timing, maybe something else, uh, try again this year uh, and let us know. Uh, things may have changed. Uh, we've got time to work things out uh, between the, before the official launch uh, later on in February. I said last week that God has made us different. Uh, we all have different roles to play uh, and in different ways to play them. Uh, so I can't say, uh, oh, I can't be involved in evangelism because I can't do what other people do. Uh, there'll be different ways that we do things. Uh, there'll be different things for us to do. And you might remember that our Invitational Evangelism team, which run Life Explored and Christianity Explored, uh, have put together a survey to help us and them uh, understand our evangelism style. The surveys are still online. Uh, it'll be there for another week. Uh, at the link that's on the screen, so please give it a go and you'll be contacted with insights and suggestions on your evangelism style uh, based on the survey uh, in a few weeks' time. Today we have seen that God is ultimately pleased with His Son, the Lord Jesus. And as those who are in Jesus, God takes pleasure in us and we are now able to please Him as well. And what a wonderful thing that is. In our final hymn, as a response to God's mercies, we present our bodies to Him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him, which is our spiritual worship.
Dear friends, we now come to the end of our time together this morning. Pastor Andy Woodliffe has shown us through Mark's Gospel that Jesus is the Son of God, the Beloved One of God, and the One who truly pleased God as no other human being could. God has revealed through His Word the identity of Jesus and His mission. Now the responsibility falls on us to accept or to reject Jesus as God's blessed King. Friends, we have a decision to make one way or another. For anyone who has been touched by God's word this morning, Dean Andrew, in his announcement, has said that there are courses available uh, for those people to further explore who Jesus is. But for those of us who have embraced Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we know we are saved by God's grace alone. So appropriately, let us end our time together this morning uh, by saying the words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.